Hello boys and girls. In this video we want to shine a light on in particular Pauli matrices but also the base vector of the SO2 group in the 2 times 2 representation as well as what is very related to that as well the 2 by 2 representations of the quaternions. And you best get a pen and paper I guess and uh, write down some of the conventions that I will go through because you will anyway you need them all your life and um, it's easy to get confused uh, oneself with these kind of conventions and if you have to look them up always it's super annoying so my real like honest to heart recommendation is that you make your your own notes of these uh, little suckers and uh, then have a reference point then in your own notation and then it's easier to compute but okay this sort of video is uh, kind of a follow up to this bonus video that I did two days ago where I talked about the use of the SO2 group in this small representation for the sake of rotations and you know the rotations in three dimension meaning you have application to also classical mechanics even if the SO2 group is usually associated more with like quantum mechanical experiments and these kind of things or maybe you come from a very mathematical perspective and see them as just another grouping group theory. But um, to my liking, I, I love to pick it up already in the classical context. And in that video, not only discussed like, you know, some general rotation re relevant basics like intrinsic versus extrinsic rotations, but I also derived the, um, the use of these matrices uh, and their relation to Hermitian matrices and spherical coordinates and so on and so forth. And um, there will be a minor recap on that as well. Uh, by the way, sorry for the last video that I did on uh, this text file. The, I accidentally messed up the resolution a little bit. I hope you don't mind too much. Uh, I think the content is still there. Um, so this video and that video that I do now, is they kind of sort of go together. Um, I guess you can watch them in any order if you have not seen the other video already. Okay, so uh, that was that. That was the this last video. Uh, it is in various playlists on my channel. Um, that's the name of it. Please uh, subscribe, of course, to this uh, channel and like it, blah, blah, blah. And with that said, let's get into it. So, so uh, this is the text that we will step through. Um, the heart of it is the discussion of these small two by two matrices. And I also want to immediately like connect them with sort of physical or at least geometrical applications. And for that sake, I will have to introduce uh, like some notation at the start. And the, the, the next few minutes is just like very basic uh, definitions and names that I will use at the end to sort of wrap it up and give meaning to it. Okay, so we're dealing with Hermitian matrices um, for a starting point. So there is, of course, you have some some uh, two by two matrix matrices with complex coefficients, and there's this nice map. The let's say conjugate transpose. I will denote it here with the star. What it does is you look at every each uh, each and every component, and you take the complex conjugate. Right, the the components are complex numbers, so you can uh, uh, like, uh, do the uh, con complex conjugation of each element and also you also transpose these two by two matrix meaning that the gamma and the beta switch places okay this is a this is just a very simple um, function and um, uh, we now define this emission matrices or which is the same in uh, the two by two case uh, self adjoint matrices uh, by the property that this function should leave a matrix invariant to call the matrix Hermitian matrix. So if you have a Hermitian matrix which has this property, um, if you have a matrix which has this property, uh, then we call it Hermitian. Sorry, I'm a little bit hasty for this video, but then maybe it's not so long. <laughs> so um, what does this mean for these two by two matrices? Well, uh, that means that the diagonal elements um, must be themselves and a number being uh, the con complex conjugate of itself means it's a real number so we have real numbers on the diagonal and 
Um, these numbers are flipped, but then related. Beta must be the conjugate of gamma and gamma must be the conjugate of beta, meaning that the real part stays fixed and the, the imaginary part gets flipped as well. Okay, this is what happens uh, if we restrict ourselves to Hermitian matrices. So um, these Hermitian matrices are of this form. And you know it's easy to convince yourself that among the two by two matrices with complex entries, which have four comp uh, complex entries, meaning eight real entries, if you demand the, the Hermitian, then what's left is four real numbers. So to cut it in half, and um, so this is this generic Hermitian matrix and. We have this bijection to a point. This is basically just, just writing down the same number uh, in another way. Just writing down the same point in another way. Um, every number like gets its slot and you can uh, go back and forth uh, between these representations because for example, if you take the trace, then the set will be gone because here's a negative sign and here's a positive sign. So you're left with two S and so that means computing the trace is the same as finding out what S is. And then you can go back and find out what Z is and so on and taking transposes. Uh, you can find out what X is and what Y is by looking what is the real part, what is the imaginary part and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, and this map is uh, linear, right? In the, as, as, as a bijection, you can convince yourself of that easily. You can pull out um, scalars and you can add two meters, uh, two points um, and this, this amounts to the same thing as adding the, the images. And, um, you know, I, I did this counting, maybe this number, uh, you can think about it yourself. I'm not sure, 100% sure if this number is is, uh, is exactly right, but it's, it's surely in the right ballpark. Um, you have a bunch of maps, I call this here K, but you, there's a bunch of uh, maps which are very similar to that. So in a way we, we, we made a choice here. We, uh, we settled for one particular way. Um, you can get very similar map by just you know flipping the the letters around. Yeah, I gave two other examples, of flipping the signs around, and I think it's four factorial because of the letter flipping, and then times two times two because of the minus signs. Uh, but you know, do the content yourself. It doesn't really matter. Um, I want to emphasize. I uh, I mean, I what I chose here is a standard um, nice matrix, and this is chosen in a way that the first row has no minus signs, okay? You can kind of identify it by that. And also, if I write it like that, I I give sort of precedence to the set um, element here. I have the set element in, in the diagonal. These are this other representation, like for example, in the book, a, a version of the map also pops up in this, in this book here. Um, and they have the X coordinate in the diagonal. But uh, since we are talking about the spherical coordinates and sort of application to classical mechanics, it's a German book I'm reading at the moment, um, uh, we want to speak about spherical coordinates and really like look at real three-dimensional space. And then the set coordinate is sort of uh, emphasized, um, as we will see in a second as well. Okay. Um, Sure, if you are in R3, then you have the standard basis vectors and you can write down any generic point X, Y, Z in terms of that. And then the, we will define another map now, right? In this video, I will actually barely have uh, much to say about this set. Since we are, again, hard in the, in the sort of three-dimensional situation, the, the SEO2 action uh, or other, uh, like, joint actions that we will, we will later see. Indeed, um, have this nice action on Hermitian matrices as um, we discussed in the last video. Um, but uh, I will mostly be interested in uh, free parameterizations, like three dimensional parameterization of points. And so this S will not be uh, as relevant in this video. And so just for the sake of being super formal, I give this map another name. This is the same as K before, except now I think of it as a map in three dimensional space and not with the fourth component here, okay? And as you can see here, the, the, this has some uh, some properties like the trace of, of H for any point is always zero since the sum over this is zero. 
stuff like that. And the determinant is also very simple to compute. And the the trace of a product of two of such matrices is also simple. It's like scalar product and norm and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, then finally, before we actually go to the poly and so on matrices, a short recap. As can be seen from this sort of image, uh, there's of course the standard spherical parameterization of uh, three-dimensional space. We have a radius which goes from zero to whatever distance. And so we just need this R and a parameterization of the two sphere. And th this parameterization can be given in terms of two angles. The one angle is zero to two pi once around the clock here uh, in the XY plane. And another um, that we choose to go from zero to pi here uh, this theta angle and phi angle and in this way from the, from the picture is clear we can reach every point on the two sphere and now the, the funky thing is that if we plug in this generic point on the two sphere call, call it here s um, which we motivated has this form right we motivated this in this in this previous video where uh, two days ago where I did the whole derivation of this sort of thing and argued for that in a lot more detail um, if you plug in s into this h as defined above here, then what happens is this cosine and sine of phi, you know, join together, cosine plus i sine of phi uh, is e to the i phi. And so this has sort of this representation. So if you see this matrix, I want you to think of this h matrix of this form, even if it looks kind of spooky, just as a parameterization of the point on two sphere. It helps if you, like in your mind, um, disregard what is at the bottom and just say, okay, I have this this top row, this like very simple looking, right? There's the set component and here you have X, Y, S here. And um, there are some minuses in the, in the bottom row, but the bottom row is determined by the fact that this is a traceless Hermitian matrix, right? So think of it like if you look at this matrix and also the other matrices it helps if you look just at the top row then it looks a little uh, less confusing okay yeah and uh, in so this way with this h map i can map any point in the real three-dimensional space to uh, r times uh, h of s because um you know we have already established that this map was cross linear so you can think of and this whole matrix is multiplied with an r then you have a generic traceless emission matrix um, of this uh, size and you also have covered all points in the in r3 the space okay now we get to the meat of it um, i will talk about these sort of matrices okay again as i said uh, get a pen and paper write down some of these conventions they are like standard conventions but uh, i will go through it and comment on it and emphasize a little bit the role they play and why they're all there um, and then there are some uh, some minuses that g get some people confused and some sort of exceptions to sort of patterns and this is the point of the video to kind of clarify that so um, first off what I do here in this video is the way I uh, write down all these matrices I do it in a very like logical fashion what I do is, if there is an overall factor, I pull all these factors out so that the top two uh, elements, the top row, is just has just components zero and one, right? So, for example, this matrix, if I read out the elements as they are, then it would be zero, i minus i, i and zero. Um, but what I do here to force that the top row is just just zeros and ones. I pull out this i. Okay, this is the way I, I write down all these this, uh, matrices here, as you can see. Um, good. This, all these matrices that we will deal here uh, with in this uh, section have a lot of special properties, like um, among other things, some are traceless, unitary, Hermitian. Uh, some of them have like all these properties at once. <laughs> um, and you can also easily establish all these things very quickly like you see whether or not it's uh, symmetric or anti-symmetric or emission anti-emission and uh, you can establish yourself uh, like convince yourself that the determinant is simple like it's on u1 in any case just by computing these, these sort of things in your head in a second um, 
And indeed, um, these, these determinants of the matrices, they are all uh, actually plus and minus one. I mean, for sure, um, there are no um, matrices that have zero determinant. Otherwise, they would not even be invertible, and these are all nicely invertible. And um, they are also have sort of norm one in the sense that like they have data uh, determinant one. And, and here, uh, I, I discussed this in, in the last video, but if you take the, um, the determinant of these matrices, which correspond to points, then you get sort of the norm. Um, and it tells me I should make a video. <laughs> okay. Um, so, and um, these matrices have a uh, determinant plus minus, like not only U1, but also plus minus one. And this is also very easy to see if you keep in mind some of the rules of how to compute determinants. Um, you know, the determinant is this multi-linear map and so on and so forth. And so uh, what happens is that if you have a, a matrix in an n times n uh, space in an n times an n times n matrix and you have an overall number like say you are in five dimensional space and so you have a five times five matrix and you have the overall factor that you want to pull out of seven then if you uh, compute the determinant of the matrix then this is the same as pulling out the factor and taking the factor and taking it to the power of five and computing the determinant of the rest of the, the matrix and multiplying this together, right? So what I'm saying here is that if you pull out um, a number, a, a scalar um, through the determinant function, then what just happens is that you're allowed to do that if you multiply it then with the number you pulled out to the power of five. And um, so from that, since, um, since whether or not you take one minus one i or minus i, if you square that, then you get always something that is either plus or minus um, one. And for that reason, it's it's immediately clear, like just from, from looking at it for a second, that all these um, matrices have determinant plus minus one, right? Because the determinant of these matrices are obviously plus minus one. And whether or not there's an I doesn't really matter. Like you, you just get yourself another um, minus sign in case there is one. Okay. So um, these matrices are all very robust, you know, they are invertible um, and have such nice anti-symmetry properties or symmetry properties and so on and so forth. So this is one first thing to notice. And uh, now we go through them uh, different, like in, in, in sort of blocks and, and uh, relate the common ones to each other. So uh, we have set up exactly this, this function from the points in, in Rn or R3 in this case. Um, to uh, now put these uh, the first Pauli matrices into correspondence with um, with the um, po points in Pauli matrices and the Pauli matrices are these nice uh, Hermitian matrices. Okay, but we see here is the following: um, we define um, sigma one as just a map under h of the ba ba first basis vector, right? So this is sort of the x-axis um, Hermitian matrix, and which just happens to be 0, 1, uh, 1, 0, because if you look again at the at this generic Hermitian matrix, this is what we had here, right? The x um, just an sign or a complex unit or so. So if z is 0, if y is 0, then we're just left with 0, x, x, 0. Um, and so in particular, if you take the unit vector, then that's what we get. Now, the, sec the second, um, the second um, Hermitian matrix we obtain this way, right? H applied to the second basis vector with this, uh, like the, the, the sort of conventional setup that we had above with the H with f first row, no negative signs. This is actually not one of the standard Pauli matrices. This is not, um, uh, sigma two, but th this is what I call here um, sigma y, um, and this is might not be just the completely standard name, but to have it in the schemes with the H matrix. So uh, the point here is that this is not the the second Pauli matrix, because the second Pauli matrix actually has an over minus sign. But this is to say, the second Pauli matrix sigma two actually has a minus sign in the top row. 
So it doesn't really fit into the scheme with the age function we have defined here. But nonetheless, uh, this, this, the, the definition of the age function uh, that we have here uh, was not like completely arbitrary. This has an other nice uh, properties, like having the first row, no neg negative signs has other nice properties than with the uh, SEO2 action. At least together with all the other conventions that we have in this video. Um, so, so um, this uh, this is special also in the sense that this is the only imaginary Pauli matrix. Maybe I, wait, I can actually go to the Wikipedia page because I think the link did the last time here. Um, sorry, this is the other video. Um, oh damn it! This is didn't want to. Sorry. Um, I also see, I, I call this file here uh, for kinetic energy, even though in this video I will not talk yet about the kinetic energy. Um, this is for another video. So, okay. So this is the article on the uh, Bloch sphere that we discussed in the last video. I'm certain the link to the Pauli matrices. What you see here is exactly, this is, this is Pauli, my dude. Where is he actually from? <laughs> ah, da, da, da. Yeah, he was Viennese. Okay, thought so. <laughs> um, so uh, what you see here is that the the second Pauli matrix he has this minus sign here, and it's also the only one that is uh, not real. It's not a real matrix, right? This is a, obviously a real symmetric matrix. This is also a real symmetric matrix. And this is an imaginary matrix by which I mean, it has only imaginary, uh, like truly imaginary entries. It is also symmetric in the, in the sense that it's Hermitian. If you do the transpose and do the complex conjugate, then you have the same thing. In that sense, it's a symmetric matrix. Um, but, um, if we look at the, the uh, I'm sure there's the SU2. Okay, let's take a quick look at the representation representation theory of SU2. Then you will see here, for example, here is a list of um, of the, like basis vectors for the SU2 Lie algebra. We will get to it in a second. But I want to emphasize here that this here is exactly the other way around. So here we have. Um, three matrices, none of which is Hermitian. In fact, they're anti-Hermitian, right? This is anti-symmetric. If you take here the, the uh, uh, conjugate transpose, the, the entries are flipped, they are the same, but uh, all are con complex conjugated to get the minus sign. So they are sort of the, the, the anti-symmetric counterparts of the Pauli matrices, right? And here is, a, is then the case that uh, you're not two reals in one imaginary, but two imaginary and one real matrix, right? And this is sort of the, the special um, in that it has uh, just real entries and the minus sign is in the, in the top. Um, of course, all the signs are, I want to emphasize, they are just conventions, but this is what you usually encounter here. Okay, we will get to them. I don't call them U because I use the letter U a lot in this video. I will call them G, little G, okay, for generators, which is what they also are. Um, okay. So, um, obviously also these sort of, uh, they form a basis, right? You can take, um, real numbers, ABC, and if you say A times Sigma one plus, uh, B times Sigma two plus C times Sigma three, then you get the traceless emission matrix, right? Matrices, right? Then you parameterize also the traceless emission matrices and whether or not you take Sigma Y or Sigma Z merely amounts to an axis flip. Okay, so, and uh, the last one is, although we, uh, again, nice um, in the sense that it's really just the image of the H as we have defined it. Okay, um, so now we have, of course, uh, defined our H, H matrix in terms of matrices, but once, if you define them, we can also go back and, you know, play the other the game from, from the other end. We could say we define the matrices as, as what they are and then define this H map in terms of um, this linear combination with the Pauli matrices as base vectors. Right? This is just a generic traceless emission matrix. Um, 
Okay, uh, the determinants of those are all, all clearly all minus one, right? Here is evident zero times zero minus one times one is minus one. Um, here uh, zero times zero minus minus one. So the determinant of this thing is uh, one. And as we argued, if we pull out the i of the determinant, we get a minus sign. So these are all minus one, as you can e easily see. And now we have the generators and the different uses of this Hermitian and anti Hermitian will also be clear, at least at the end of the video. So um, what we have here is that the generators are basically just um, the uh, a, a multiple of the um, poly matrices. And here you will then immediately see uh, where things get like sadly a little bit confusing because of this, the, these conventions. So um, G1 is just I times uh, sigma one, i.e. it's the imaginary unit, when, you know, the, the thing which ma makes it complex anti-symmetric, which ma makes it anti-emission, like multiplying with I does that to you. Um, times the basis, the first basis vector under this encoding H. And now the second generator, right, as you saw it here, the second generator is zero, minus one, one, uh, zero, is this matrix, right? I just put out the minus one to adhere to my convention of having positive numbers in the top row. And you can now see that this is actually not I times the Pauli matrix, but I times this matrix, right? If you take this, this uh, sigma Y and multiply it with I, then I get minus one for the overall top right component, right? So the connection between the SU2 in this standard representation, for example, and the uh, Pauli matrix as we, ha as we had it there, is that the second one that the second one, uh, at least if you take the sign conventions as, as exemplified on this Wikipedia article, <coughs> um, has sort of the wrong sign for the second uh, matrix, which is why, and indeed the second Pauli matrix is also not the map under the return value under the map as I have defined it with this H. And this H is really the, also kind of as nice as it gets. So this is a little bit of a sucker here. Um, good, so keep that in mind. Um, yeah. And then it turns out that this matrix, you know, this real and this symmetric matrix is exactly the product of two of the Pauli matrices. So if we multiply the first one and the third one, these are both real, real matrices. You know, they are really real matrices. If we, it's clear that if you multiply these two real matrices, we will get uh, another real matrix because no imaginary unit had the place to enter. Also, these also have evidently determinant minus one. So the product will have determinant one. And so it's easy to believe that, um, that this thing, you know, if you compute the the determinant here then is also zero times zero minus minus one. Um, this has determinant minus one. And uh, 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 let me Yes, okay. I'm a little bit confused. Um so the let me let me quickly check that in my head. The determinant of this thing is um, the the minus sign does not matter at all because um, the it, it gets squared when you want to pull it out. So it is ah okay. So this is positive, right? So th uh, I confused myself because of before I I, I I didn't follow my own rule of of squaring it when you pull it out. But the determinant here is zero times zero minus minus one times one. So this is positive. Um, and so things match out, right? You can you can quickly believe that this is this is correct, and um, so this is basically the, the f if you multiply these two, you get the third one, and also it turns out that the um, the multiplication of the um, poly matrices um, is also extremely special, 
And if you would switch these indices, then you get actually just one minus sign. Um, one overall minus sign. Uh, okay. So, um, and this is also sort of what motivates uh, what motivates the definition as it is, right? So, of course, if you use the the, the sigma two poly matrix as it is defined and usually used, then maybe in some other algebraic uh, operation like multiplying these poly matrices together, you see one one less minus sign, and then it helps, uh, or you can write down uh, your your um, uh, you know your variant of the Lie algebra multiplication rule more more simply, right? So we will see here the I'm certain they immediately write down the the anti-commuting relation um, yeah, here. So here, this is the anti-commutator. This is the uh, commutator. There are some nice relation that you can write down uh, like very efficiently. And if you would change the sign of the poly two, then you would have probably to introduce some extra symbol. And so this is why this is why uh, there are then some 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 minus signs that confuse you. Uh, and, and make some problems as soon as you use it then for example for rotations or if you relate it to the anti um group um, generators that if, of the SU2 transformations. Okay, so um, yeah, so this uh, G2 is the one real SU2 generator, right? We had uh, uh, I already said that in the for the SU2 the algebra there's only one real one um and yeah uh so here you see that the generator right is a, is a product of these two poly matrices these two poly matrices were basis vectors for the hermitian matrices but this thing is anti-hermitian so we see that the hermitian ness is not closed um and this is also why we see here uh in if you take this this sort of uh product with the, uh, the, the commutator product with the minus sign, like this is the product of the Lie algebra, um, then we have to introduce an I to make it Hermitian again, right, to be closed. On the one hand, uh, on the other hand, uh, the poly matrices have this nice anti-commuting property. This has, so when you compute the this sort of product, but with a plus sign in between, then, then actually this works out again, um, because the anti-Hermitian anti parts cancel out. Um, Okay, uh, and also I want to emphasize then that this this matrix, you know, zero minus one, one zero. This is also the standard example that is given uh, for a two-dimensional representation of um, like two-dimensional real representation of the complex numbers and the complex number multiplication um, by by introducing algebraic rules to mimic i.e. represent the property of the imaginary unit, right? So this matrix 0, minus 1, 1, 0, like overall, um, also has the property that if you square it, then you get actually minus 1, which is exactly the behavior of the imaginary unit. And so uh, this matrix and the unit matrix as a basis for a vector space um, over the real numbers actually gen just generate the uh the closed field that is the complex numbers and um the the funky thing is of course that the this, this matrix is not the only matrix which does that you can also take for example um this matrix here right if you multiply this with itself then what you get is and you can do it in your head uh also minus because of the square of the i uh, times the unit matrix. So this also gives an equally well a representation of the imaginary uh, axis the, the, and, and thus the complex numbers. And so here we have several representations and I will show you a third, time, a third one in a second. And uh, this then leads us uh, immediately to the relation to the quaternions, right? There is this one perspective. This is the original sort of Hamiltonian perspective that you you kind of view the Hamilton the quaternions as an extension of the complex numbers by two more um, dimensions. I have uh, some some videos, of course, on 
such topic or I don't seem to link it here, but I have the, I have these videos on the uh, quaternion algebras, the more general ones. Um, it is likely in the algebra list. Uh -huh. Doesn't show me all the, all the playlists. Here, algebra. So I have these, these videos as you see here, um, come on, on the general uh, quaternion algebra. So this is not just the matrices which square to minus one, but I talk about it over general field and I talk the exponentiation function in general for the quaternion algebras um, in this generalized sense. Um, and so here is one imaginary unit and indeed this matrix um, is then also called the J quaternion, right? I call it QJ here, just to not have uh, too many simple letters here. Um, and then plus minus uh, this matrix, uh, usually plus, um, is the typically taken to be this, this uh, quaternion in their two by two representation. And um, yeah, this plus minus one is, you know, is of course, essentially the same that you have if you take the real numbers and do a field extension, then you have the Galois group where you can decide do you want to extend it in the plus or minus direction. Um, but that's not really substantial. We, get, we go then on, right? We have already this identification. The, the G3, the, the generator of SU2, the third one, again behaves nicely. This is an anti-emission matrix, looks like so. And this is called this is then uh, basically always the the, um, the i uh, quaternion, right? And uh, then what you know, this completes the poly matrices, uh, including the sigma y and the the generators. And if you take then the quaternions as defined here, then you can you know they are this they form this algebra generated by two elements. This is exactly what the other video is about. And um, if you multiply them together, then you get the K quaternion. And depending on the sign here, you also have this sign here. And then it, like it very easily turns out, like just by this rule, um, that this is then also minus plus the second generator. So one perspective you can you can have here, I mean, it, it might be that you see Lie algebra generators as sort of the fundamental structure in the sense that they are ge geometric, right? They are basically the tangent vectors at the one of the Lie group. But um, at least if you're coming from a physical perspective and you um, make primary observables, which will be some real numbers, uh, ostensibly, it will be some, some di di digitalization or analog uh, measurement read off of what is modeled as real numbers anyway, then uh, what is primary are numbers or lists of real numbers and lists of real numbers correspond more to Hermitian matrices, at least in quantum mechanics. Um, so then from that perspective, the simpler object is the Hermitian object and not the anti-Hermitian object. And, and from that perspective, you would say that the generators of SU2, which have this extra I, which makes them anti-Hermitian, are um, are the sort of the derived concept and you would take care of the I explicitly. That's why you sometimes have the physicist convention where you have more complex units in the Lie, uh, algebra, Lie group and Lie algebra treatment. Okay. Um, yeah, and finally I want to mention that if you go back to K, right, if you remember K was the map H except extended to these four dimensions, then clearly if you apply K to the, the one remaining uh, base vector, if you will, then you merely get the unit matrix. And the unit matrix is the central object in the sense of the center. It's the central object in the algebras, um, of the quaternion algebras, for example. And indeed, you get them easily by multiplying matrices together. Namely, every matrix uh, we have discussed here uh, is a multiple of the unit matrix. So you can see this here, for example. If you multiply G3 with itself, clearly you get minus the unit matrix. If you multiply uh, sigma1 with itself, you get the unit matrix and so on. Okay. 
Yeah, so we might call this sigma zero, just uh, th this is very convenient to write, you know, summation, summations over uh, components to represent um, generic emission matrices, for example. So for example, if you want to have uh, this object expressed as a sum over sigma matrices with, with uh, real components, then it, it, it's convenient if the fourth I have here in the fourth component or in the zero component, you know, it doesn't really matter. Um, then it's convenient to call sigma zero the the zero th, um, poly matrix. But of course, it has uh, it it has very different properties than the poly matrix matrices because it is not a traceless matrix. Um, yeah. Okay. I here I emphasize that. The, these matrices, including the zero ones, where the unit matrix squares, so the unit matrix, but these all square the unit matrix. Uh, this is, should be a G. Let's fix that. So, um, so here I give an example. Yeah, and, and you have these sort of nice closeness properties. This is sort of the Lie algebra property that you multiply two and you get a third. It's like a cross product. And indeed, there, there are some isomorphisms between cross products in three dimension and these things. But okay, um, so uh, now we uh, we have now emphasized and discussed in some detail these uh, poly matrices. And now I give a sort of motivation why they are actually super important and relevant uh, to geometry. Uh, here is one remark. Uh, if you take the determinant, um, you can define it like this or like this infinite sum. Uh, in any case, there is this formula, the, the, the determinant of the exponential of A, and you might need to restrict A, but for invertible matrices, it truly works. Uh, this is E to the trace of, of things, right? So this is also then why if the, uh, you have a traceless matrix, uh, meaning E to the power of zero would be one, then you get um, a special matrix, right? taking a, a traceless generator and taking the the exponential form, which the exponent x, x function of it takes you from some algebra matrices to um, this nice special um, uh, matrices in this way. Um, and indeed, you know, our poly matrices and my, our G generators and so on, they were traceless matrices. And indeed, if you take this generators G, then you get unitary matrices. Okay, what are unitary matrices? Okay, this is oh, probably you know that, but okay, they, they have this property that the inverse is exactly the uh, complex trans uh, conjugate transpose, and the con conjugate transpose is in general, of course, trivial to compute, while it, uh, computing the in inverse might be difficult for two times two matrices, both of them is. is more or less simple um, but um, in any case this holds also in any dimension and it's in any case simpler so in another uh, video namely the one on the Rodriguez formula here and this one I uh, proved this property this is sort of the generalized Euler formula uh, namely that if you have an operator let's say here matrix which if you uh, cube it then you get some number in the field j times j or you say differently you know if j is invertible then this says that if you take the matrix j and square it then you get a multiple of the unit matrix then this means that the exponential formula defined as this uh, series with the you know one over k factorial gives exactly this sort of relation um if little j and big j is just the imaginary unit, then this uh, reduces to the Euler formula. So what you then have here is that these j's here cancel, and this e and this one cancels, and you're left with sine and cosine, because uh, sine uh, hyperbolicos of i z is the sine of z and so on. Okay. Yeah, and uh, given the fact that these generators, g squared to minus 1, we can uh, immediately establish this relation, right? I take the 
uh, angles one half of some some uh, some Greek letter in anticipation, but of course this goes with any angle. We have this sort of relationship. Exactly these matrices, which squared or minus one, <coughs> fulfill this property that they behave like the imaginary unit in the Euler formula. And if you don't, uh, like if you just do the x function along this particular very special axis vectors, you know, if we don't mix, if there are no complicated products involved in this in this computation here, then we get simply this relation, right? So the, these unitary matrices, as I have claimed here, that these are indeed unitary, not hard to see, but uh, I'll leave it open for now. Um, I have this, this, this forms, okay. And I want you, uh, you to be clear what this means, right? This means that if you have any of these, like any, any two of these three matrices and want to, um, for example, you want to commute them to, uh, as unitary matrices, then what you have to do is just use this sort of algebraic rule, right? That you have, um, for example, G1 and G3 is minus, you know, plus maybe some, uh, like up to some factor, uh, G2. There are like these, now these algebraic rules that given that you have this, given that you have these simple rules about how to compute, commute uh, the sigma matrices, now you know how to commute quaternions and SU elements. And because at least these unitary matrices along the axis decompose like so you know, these unitary matrices end up being again in the Lie algebra uh, although I don't want to confuse you here with switching between Lie algebra and Lie group also I, I look at the camera because because of streaming I have the camera here and I tend to look at the camera but the camera is here so sorry for that um, uh, so now the, the I want to emphasize that suddenly they a lot of operations now become algebraic. You don't even have to look at the matrix elements uh, of these things, right? So, I mean, you can also compute the matrix element of this, right? G0 uh, uh, was defined as um, the unit matrix and G1 was, was this thing. So what we have here is that this X is um, as a matrix cosine of this angle as first component, then I sine of this angle, then I sine of this angle, and then cosine of this angle again. So uh, th this is of course some matrix and you can easily like put it together because you know what the G matrices are. But the point is that computing around with these, um, with these U matrices and, and even if you multiply them with poly matrices or generators, then it's easy to compute it just by looking at the permutation properties. Okay. Uh, if you want to actually, if you if it things get complicated and you do take the X, not of these simple matrices, but some combination of them, right? Then um, you might get some uglier matrix. And if you actually look at the, the components of the matrices as you multiply them together, uh, here's a hint, it might be he helpful to make use of this relation because with this relation, you can get rid of some sort of this one halves. I talked about this one halves in the last video. Um, and so that's why if you multiply more use together, you don't, you shouldn't be surprised if suddenly this one halves disappear because there are these nice rules. Okay. Um, so second to last, I want to talk about the, uh, adjoint action, which then will put the, uh, unitary matrices and the poly matrices to use. So, uh, we define this function, which basically a function of, of two arguments. First it's a function of, uh, any group element and then something on which it acts, right? So the joint action of G is just this product. And I define it where, wherever G is invertible and whatever the multiplication is. Of course, my main application is going to be to two by two matrices. Um, and, you know, there's also the other map, which is uh, the one where you, uh, but you're already given, namely that you can invert this G up front and then you get another transformation, which is similar. And, um, okay, but that's just uh, as an aside. What I want to emphasize is that there, this thing has a nice concatenation property. Namely, if you uh, apply to M first G, the joint uh, action of G, and then the joint action of H, right? This would be like this f sort of thing. Then you can also like uh, manipulate the brackets and use the properties of the inverse and find out that, hey, this actually is just 
the adjoint of the, the product of these two matrices or these two operations, these two operators um, to M. So here we can turn the concatenation to a multiplication, right? Okay. Um, and so for, as an example, you know, let's say you have to compute the adjoint action of this on some matrix M. Um, U is this thing, right? as you can see here. Oh, yeah, right. Sorry. Just one second. Mm. Mm. Um. Oh, sorry. I, I was looking at Psi, but I have I should have been looking at var phi. So this matrix, um, G3 is a diagonal matrix. G3 is um, this thing. And here we take X of this. So it should not be too surprising that what it comes out here is another diagonal matrix and it is this thing. Okay. And if you take, uh, this is a unitary matrix. So inverting it just means taking the adjoint. And then these minus signs flip. And uh, so what happens here is that you can then pull out these, these factors. Um, and uh, combine combine them pairwise to, to cancel this out. But for the, for the first matrix, uh, you you pull out the this positive x, and for the other one, you pull out the negative. And um, what you end up with is just this very simple like product. This is like the simplest case where you can actually compute a joint action very trivially. That's why I give it an, as an example. The other one involves trigonometric function. But this is sort of just so you get a feel for it. What does this action action actually mean in practice? So this would be this sort of product. Um, and there are some phases involved and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, and now, so basically our grand finale, the conclusion is the following. If you take the joint action of a sequence of these, all of these matrices, and apply it to, to set, to the set axis base vector in the Hermitian representation. Well, okay, uh, the, the first one, um, so sorry, as a re as a reminder, this this uh, h on e three. This is of course just uh, sigma one, uh, sigma three, right? This is just this thing. And so the applying the psi uh, unitary matrix, um, this one here will not do anything to it because everything is diagonal. So uh, sorry. So we can scratch this one. This doesn't do anything. So what we're really interested in in, in is this thing, right? And so if, and, and, and remember, these, ma these matrices, as I have argued above, are just given as, as uh, elements in the Lie algebra. They are just these simple matrices in terms of Gs. So you know how to compute the product even without, even without the multi ma matrix multiplication, just by permuting these matrices around. Like uh, it's, it will be still some work, but after some time, um, you arrive at something hopefully simpler. And then um, eventually it turns out if you do this, you know, uh, doing this or doing the matrix multiplication explicitly or using Mathematica, then you find out this is exactly this thing. But hey, haven't we seen this before? Yeah, this is exactly the generic point on the two sphere, right? So um, this is this result. And uh, what this means is that the this this product together applied to the vector the unit vector pointing in that direction is exactly the same as rotating it uh, this is exactly how we obtained the spherical coordinates right so the coordinates here we obtained by first turning this along theta and then moving it around and this is exactly what what these um what the action here of this su2 elements does and um I mean, uh, I, I skipped the, the, the nasty computation here, but this shows that you can use the SE2 for rotations of just uh, points in free space. So this is this SE2 action, of course. And the uh, the SE2 action, uh, you know, I, I discussed in some length in the last video, there's actually like this two to one correspondence. If you compute an overall factor in any, in any uh, adjoint, action here right so sorry 
um, here, if you if you don't use g but minus g, then the result will be the same because minus cancels out. So the SU2 is a bigger group than this rotation group, but nonetheless, this is the magic of it. Okay, and so to wrap this up, to leave it under one hour, uh, I want to also to emphasize that you now we saw that taking the x of these g's, where the g's go, is one of the three g's, um, will in general be uh, another sum of, of g's because it will again be in the Lie algebra, right? The exponent, the x, x function doesn't leave the, uh, the, the, sorry, no, sorry, not, not in the Lie algebra, but in the algebra. No, the Lie algebra is defined by the anti-commuting product. And I'm talking now about just using the normal product of the matrices, which can be used to define the Lie algebra. But uh, so what is better to say is this will be again be in the algebra. And so you have again a com combination of three G's, but uh, you know, so if you get two GIs and they are multiplied with each other, you might get a, a unitary matrix. So there's also another component. And this relationship um, is sort of the relationship also to, between the, the axis angle, you know, the, 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 the angle of which, like speaking now in terms of rotations, the angle around which, the axis around which you rotate by some angle. I discussed this in painful detail in, in this video. Um, and on the other hand, you also have uh, the just the quaternions, which also encode the same information about rotations. Right? Here's the full sentence. Okay. Yeah, um, I'm under one hour. I, I uh, now I have already like collected a very nice series all about rotations. There's still a lot to say, but uh, what's next up? I will use all these tools for the sake of first discussing the kinetic energy of a free particle in classical mechanics, and then I will use that um, to discuss again the spherical pendulum to which I made a video already a week ago. Peace out. I don't know why I look at this camera. This is this camera is off. Peace out. <laughs>